I'd like to introduce our panel for this afternoon. It's our Provider Voices panel. To my far right is James Guthrow. James is a social worker at the QE2 Emergency Department. He also works with the Department of Health and Wellness and is a member of our Diversity Committee. Then we have Shireen Singer, a clinical social worker with the IWK in the middle over here. Robert Wright, to my right, social worker, lecturer, and PhD student, recipient of the Canadian Association of Social Work Distinguished Services Award. To my left is Valerie White, Chief Executive Officer, Senior Secretary, oh, sorry, it's not the Seniors, Department of Seniors, that's changed. And Lori Eiler, Executive Director of Bryony House. I'm pleased to have everybody up here today. So like this morning, we have three questions that we gave the panelists to help them prepare the presentation. So the three questions are, what is your connection to domestic violence? Have you experienced barriers in your work that made it difficult for you to respond to individuals and families experiencing domestic violence as effectively as you would like? And if so, can you tell us about them? Number three, do you have examples of what worked well when identifying or responding to domestic violence within our diverse communities? Okay, and we will start with James Guthrow. Thanks for being here. Um, as uh, Sandy had mentioned, uh, I work uh, as a social worker in the QE2 emergency department um, at the Halifax Infirmary. Um, my world is basically in relation to um, dealing with crisis or trauma-related situations um, in relation to the fact of providing brief, intense counseling intervention to clients in acute stress-related situations. As this relates to the first question in relation to conne uh, uh, connection to domestic violence, um, we do get a fair f um, uh, number of folks who do come in through the emergency department uh, who are in domestic violence-related violence uh, situations. Um, it really kind of spans, uh, spans diversity, if you will, and we see folks from different ethnic backgrounds, we see folks who are disabled, we see elderly folks, um, we see also see situations where uh, adolescents are abusing their parents. Uh, we see folks from different sexual orientations in regards to folks who are, uh, identify themselves uh, from the LGBT community. Um, and we also get folks from uh, different marginalized or oppressed groups as well. One of the biggest challenges for me uh, working as a social worker in the emergency department at the QE2 is that over the last couple of years that um, I've seen uh, an increase in numbers of folks who are disclosing or, or identifying that they are being abused or males that are being abused by their same-sex partners, folks who are in transgendered relationships, and also even in situations where men are being abused by their female partners. So we are seeing an increase. It's still a small number, but we are, still, we are uh, definitely seeing an increase as it relates to the social work department being involved in those particular situations that come in through the emergency department. Um, in relation to the second question in regards to barriers, um, some of the barriers, and I want to kind of just focus on uh, some of the challenges as it relates to our LGBTI population or subgroup. Um, some of the barriers uh, that I see in trying to refer folks um, um, to resources or supports in the community is the issue with shelters or safe houses for folks um, who identify themselves as, uh, as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered, or men who are being abused by their, by their, uh, by their female partners. Um, one of the challenges, because someone had mentioned to me at one time, do you refer to some of the men's homeless shelters? That's a challenge for us in the emergency department or myself as a social worker for the simple fact that that particular environment um, houses folks who, who are in some cases homeless, who have mental illness, et cetera. And referring folks um, who are LGBTI or LGBT identified, it's not always a great fit for them to be in that particular environment, okay? Uh, from a resource perspective, resource materials, it's a, it's a challenge to find resource materials besides looking on the internet. Um, I did some research in relation to books and calling around to find, seeing if there's books for uh, same-sex partners and domestic violence relationships or transgendered folks, and the materials are pretty rare, pretty sparse. 
So that's a challenge. And even in the social work department, uh, we have great information. Um, I know there was one book that was uh, put out by um, the status of women. I, I, I can't remember the title offhand. Fantastic resource. But it would you might be nice to have resources that are a little bit more focused as it relates to folks who are LGBT or LGBTI identified. Education. Um, Working in the ER department is a very much a collaborative teamwork environment, um, and some folks uh, or some different some prof uh, some professionals who work in that particular environment have a level of comfort in working with folks who are LGBT identified, uh, men who are abused by their female partners, but in situations where um, there are situations where other professionals don't feel comfortable in those particular situations. So there is certainly some education that could be had in that particular situation. And I should also add, even in situations where women are being abused, there is sometimes a level of uh, uncomfort in the ER in dealing with those situations as well. So again, education is a big thing. Uh, clinical research. Um, when I was doing some research and preparing for this particular panel, there's not a lot of research out there as it relates to, to gay men. Trans, transgendered folks, uh, men who are abused by, by women. Um, so from that perspective, it would be nice to have research or, or have some level or more clinical research into that particular area. And in relation to the third question, um, examples in regards to responding to domestic violence, I know from my perspective is that you want to recognize the similarities and the differences that exist in regards to domestic violence. There are certainly similarities as it relates to power and control, but there are definitely differences. From, a, from a, uh, being a gay man myself, um, it's, it can be you know, challenging. If I was in a relationship uh, where my partner was abusing me, there's always threats if you're not out that the person may out you. So there is a difference there as it relates to, to women being abused. Looking for signs as it relates to domestic violence and also responding in relation to support, compassion, being a good listener, patience, validation, talking about safety, et cetera. I think they're very key as it relates to working with folks who are in domestic violent relationships. I'm uh, really delighted to be here today to represent the IWK, but more importantly, to really be the voice of children and adolescents um, who have been um, involved in situations of childhood maltreatment and abuse. Um, certainly what brings me to this field, I've been working as a clinical social worker for approximately 33 years, uh, both uh, having a private practice as well as working in not-for-profit and at both levels of government, provincial and federal. So most of my career has been working with victims and offenders. Um, my role on the child protection team, for those of you who may not be aware of the child protection team, we are a multidisciplinary team. We have two pediatricians. We have a clinical nurse specialist and a clinical social worker that do the intake part of it. Um, and there's myself who does the therapy with the children, youth, and families. And we have a psychologist as well that does cognitive and psychoeducational assessments and works primarily in the uh, uh, work with young children from like birth to three years old. And of course, an administrative assistant. Uh, most members of our team are involved in teaching, research, and consultation. And because the IWK is a teaching hospital, we have uh, medical residents and uh, social work uh, graduate students and nursing students and occupational therapy students. So that's always exciting uh, for me, where I'm kind of coming to the end of my um, uh, career to be able to kind of pass along the knowledge. Um, just to give you an idea of statistics, in 2010 and 11, there were 237 referrals to the child protection team. Of those 237, 14 approached the team and self-identified as victims of domestic violence. 
Um, in 2011-12, there were 185 referrals, and of those, 13 self-identified as domestic violence. However, I'm working with children, youth, and families where there's been physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, witness and exposure to domestic violence. And, you know, certainly in the three years I've been at the IWK, um, there's a weaving of domestic violence through all those uh, facets of childhood maltreatment. Um, the children and youth that are exposed to or experience domestic violence, um, you know, their exposure may be in that they're hearing one parent uh, or caregiver threaten the other, um, as observe a parent who's out of control or reckless with anger, see one parent assault another, or just live with seeing the aftermath of a domestic violence situation. Um, and of course, in working with these children and youth, that's not done in isolation because they, they live in the context of family and other uh, service uh, systems. Uh, so it's to engage the uh, non-offending parent, but also if there's um, excess with the children and youth with the offending parent, or there's reconciliation, then it's very important to engage the offending parent in treatment as well. Um, many of the children are also affected just by hearing the threats to the safety of their caregiver, uh, regardless of whether it results in physical injury. But of course, as many of us in the field know and recognize that children who live with domestic violence are also at an increased right risk to become direct victims of childhood uh, abuse. Um, certainly some of the short-term effects uh, were mentioned this morning by Dr. Gass. Um, a lot of those are post, what I call post-traumatic stress responses versus a disorder because I believe we have a built-in survival mechanism um, that is really a response, and it's not something to be pathologized. It's what enables women and children and families to get through. Certainly, the long-term uh, effects lead to the more chronic health issues that were spoken about this morning, such as substance use and mental health. Um, and of course, uh, exposure to domestic violence with children and youth always shows up in their school performance, um, often mimics ADHD when in fact it could be uh, symptoms of trauma in their poor school performance and uh, impaired ability to concentrate. Um, some of the barriers that I experience in my work is uh, Primarily the fact that most systems of care are not trauma-informed, and by that I mean a trauma-informed child and family service system is one in which all parties involve, recognize, and respond to the impact of traumatic stress on those who have had contact with the system, children, youth, caregivers, service providers. Programs and agencies within such a system infuse and sustain trauma awareness, knowledge, and skills into their organizational cultures, practices, and policies, and acting in collaboration with all those who are involved with the child, using the best available science to facilitate and support the recovery and the resiliency of the child and family. And one thing that uh, was very important to me, uh, because so much of my career has been working with men who have offended, was to start a boys group, which I did in the fall. Um, and these were all children who have been victims of um, violence, various kinds of violence, perpetrated by their male parent as well as their female parent but it was to really not only deal with their own victimization, but to really um, encourage them and uh, kind of declare to them 
that the violence can stop in their generation. So we called uh, the group Young Men's Work, Breaking the Cycle of Violence, and it happened to concur at the same time when there were citywide marches in Halifax to stop community violence. Uh, they got to participate in that, have their picture taken with the mayor, with the police, of Ch police chief, uh, which was very exciting for them. And they also participated in a commemoration at, uh, I think it was Government House, to stop violence against women and children. And so for some of those children, um, that, that was phenomenal for them. And to just profile one boy who lives uh, in an area of the HRM where community violence has been historical and prevalent, it's been uh, humbling for me as a clinician to see how he's gone back to his community where he lives with violence every day in his school uh, children in junior high bringing guns and knives to school, and yet um, he signed, as all the boys did, this um, pledge that they would stop violence in themselves, their families, and in their generation. And so he um, is not participating in the violence anymore, and that's a real credit to that work. And uh, so I'm looking forward to starting that again in the fall. So thank you so much for having me here and uh, for being able to be the voice of children. Thanks. Given the soundbite nature of the panel, I'll apologize in advance for the lack of nuance in my opening comments. And I'll look forward to your pillaring me in the discussion period of the day. Like many, my connection with domestic violence is deep and conflicted. As a child, I was a child witness, victim of domestic violence in its most extreme forms. And I'm told that the father of my, uh, two of my older siblings would regularly take out a shotgun and fire shots at my mother's feet and above her head. And I watched my own father attempt to kill my mother at least once uh, when she spent four months in hospital with multiple fractures and internal injuries. Professionally, and particularly as a child welfare professional, I have had, I've worked with scores of families where domestic violence was a central or substantial reason for our involvement, and sadly, I have watched in many, though not all cases, our child welfare practice in the context of domestic violence further distress families, overly targeting the primary caregiver of the children, failing to engage the person identified as the primary aggressor, and ultimately doing little to support the best interest of children. On a personal level, I have been the friend of many people who were or are in relationships where violence is an issue in some cases being a significantly involved advocate and friend, and in other cases being a powerless and passive observer. I've also been the victim of documented violence in my former marriage. And though uh, uh, my wife was charged and convicted with assault, uh, I would say that towards the end of our relationship, as is the case toward the ends of most relationships, the dynamics that brought our marriage to an end had us both feeling like victims of oppression and violence of a sort. So for my part, I recognize that domestic violence is complex. It is certainly a discussion that must be gendered in its analysis. It is an issue that is very different in different cultures and classes, particularly where physical violence is a more normalized part of the lived history and experience of peoples. And I say the lived history of peoples and not people's culture. Because, for example, I do not believe that violence is a part of black culture. Rather, I would say that Africans in the diaspora have been significantly and systematically subjected to violence perpetrated by the state, industry, and other authorities and they have been relegated to the margins of civil society where violence is an essential part of survival. So we need to understand that violence, then, is linked to these histories and not think of violence as uh, embedded in people's culture. Uh, experiencing barriers. In a child welfare setting, the greatest frustration I've experienced in my career was that the practice tends to focus on the primary caregiver, 
often, though not always, a woman. The caregiver then is subjected to the intrusive social work visits, demands to attend counseling and services, advised to move or go seek shelter in order to keep children from witnessing violence. Again, the child welfare practice is not concerned with the victim of the violence, but with the children who are witnessing the violence. Little in my practice early on was done to actually restrain the primary perpetrator of violence. Quite often, after news of yet another incident of violence, the primary care provider would be visited and again warned that if they couldn't keep their children safe, the agency may need to take the children into care. Now, I've been away from child welfare practice directly for about six, seven years or so, well, a little longer than that now, I guess. Uh, but um, I'm still relatively close to the practice, and in many locations, I would have to confess my observation being that the practice hasn't changed significantly. So, do I have examples of where this has been done differently and better? Yes. When I was in Cumberland County as the Director of Family and Children's Services, we developed a community to par partnership early in my time there to address this unfair targeting of children's caregivers. We called it creating a community of concern, and it was a collaboration between child welfare, the local transition house, Autumn House, and the local police. And we were at the forefront of shining the light on little used sections of the Family and Children's Services Act, which enabled child welfare agencies to prosecute individuals who were interfering with children who were under the supervision of an agency and could require that certain individuals not reside with the children that they were interfering with, for example. Awakening these tools gave social workers much needed authority to actively engage primary perpetrators in services and to monitor their movements to ensure they were following court-ordered limits. In the event of violations, and there were very few, it was our experience that the family courts under the Family and Children's Services Act were much more responsive to prosecuting offenders than the criminal courts were under the Criminal Code of Canada. So those are my opening comments. Thank you, Sandy. I'd like to congratulate the organizers of this day. I've been here since uh, early morning, and it really is a fantastic event. So congratulations to you. Uh, I'm really pleased to bring the issue of senior abuse or elder abuse to the, the event today. Um, I've been involved in, in this field for a long time. The, what was the Senior Secretariat was started in 1980, and it was really meant to focus in and be a policy and planning arm for the provincial government. And so a couple of the first things we did was to work with others, of course. Collaboration has always been big because we've always been a, a small department. And so we developed uh, a first uh, hospital protocol and then began to work uh, across uh, departments to uh, put in place an adult, the Adult Protection Act. Um, so uh, then we continued to, uh, through our consultations and workshops, uh, educate, uh, advocate, uh, do all the kinds of things that we knew needed to be done to uh, hopefully one day end uh, abuse of seniors. In uh, 2005, we released a strategy, uh, an elder abuse strategy, and uh, we launched a seniors information referral line in uh, 2007. And so we began uh, working with and financially supporting uh, groups of uh, people that uh, work for seniors, work on behalf of seniors, uh, and namely the senior safety programs that were initiated uh, probably 17 years ago by the RCMP. Since we've been supporting them, uh, there are now 14 programs in place, and we're really pleased that one of those programs is on uh, the uh, reserve, Eskasoni. And we funded uh, the uh, Black Social Workers Association to put on a conference, and elder abuse, uh, the topic of elder abuse was part of that. We are now developing a toolkit, uh, it's just uh, about ready to be printed, which will, uh, we will train some what we're calling community champions, and it will be really helping those folks with the information that's in this 
uh, organize workshops in their own community. So we'll be recruiting young people or people of any age, uh, retired people, to become a champion in their community and therefore spin out the kinds of information that needs to be out there. Um, we acknowledge the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in uh, June each year, and we provide $250 grants to nonprofit organizations to do something in their community to create more awareness. The, the barriers I would say that we have had is uh, uh, really the stigma about elder abuse, to get people talking about it, and we believe that uh, if we can get more and more people talking about it and, and understand the different types of abuse and know when they are being abused, that uh, that will really go a long way to where we eventually want to be. And it really has been a challenge to uh, get people to talk openly, but we see it happening now, and, uh, and that's uh, a good thing. So. Uh, I think, as uh, speaker said, uh, you know, you're never, the work is never done, uh, but you chip away at it, and eventually it does make a difference. And, of course, the other barrier uh, and challenge is that there needs to be more services in local communities, and we can only do that by further developing partnerships, collaborations, working with uh, the elder law uh, community, lawyers, uh, the police, all those stakeholders that uh, need to be involved uh, in, this, in this issue. And the third question, um, you know, what, what's the best uh, approach? I guess in social, in uh, child welfare, where I started uh, my career, is believe the client. And of course, uh, with our toll-free line, we've heard some pretty bizarre stories over time, but I really think that if that person knows you believe them and they feel that trust and they know that you, you mean what you say, that you'll be there to support them and get involved in really active listening, that um, that goes a long way to helping that person bring about the change that's necessary in their life. And of course, it's also important to know the resources that are at hand. Even though we may need more, there are lots of good resources in the community and if you have those to refer people uh, again, that goes a long way to help them resolving the, uh, the trauma that they're experiencing. Thank you. First, I came in a little late, so I, I just want to make a few clarification points. Um, many transition houses across the province do, I think there was a statement that there should be, that they should uh, accept homeless women, and many of them do. They certainly recognize the needs in their own communities uh, where numbers allow, and their uh, mandate has expanded. They, they do uh, accept homeless women in their, in their uh, shelter, transition house. Briny House does not, because we uh, were very full with the mandate that we have, and there are two other uh, homeless shelters in HRM to be able to manage that, their population. So we make lots of referrals back and forth, but we don't accept that directly. Uh, secondly, uh, there are French-speaking staff in uh, transition houses. Briny House has two that uh, speak French and, um, and other languages as well, but we just want to clarify that because there are some across the province that do that. So if they're just in terms of clarification for misunderstandings or misinformation. So um, also I just want to acknowledge certainly that our clients uh, and the residents that come to Briny House, from my perspective, are incredibly strong women. Um, as as uh, abused or as broken as they come, they're incredibly resilient, and uh, and I'm not sure I could do it. They, you know, the stories that they tell and the lives that they've led um, to be able to move forward, mostly for the sake of their children, um, is uh, absolutely astounding to me. So I'm just going to give you very quickly kind of a day in the life at our shelter. Uh, on the average, we have 23 uh, average days are about 23 days. We have serviced 430 women and children so far this year um, in our fiscal, for the fiscal year, and our fiscal year ends in March. Uh, today, we have 21 residents at our shelter. We have capacity for 24 adults and children, and we have six cribs, so we have a total capacity of 30. We really needed to um, uh, use the cribs and also coaches and bed, uh, cots and all those kinds of things. But today, we have 21 residents, 12 of which are children, uh, which are always fun when they're running all over the house. We have three women who have been identified as high risk for lethality. Uh, we had four in February, but as of March, we have three right now as of this week. Uh, we have one woman who speaks only Arabic. Two of her children only speak Arabic. We have one woman who speaks Parisian. Uh, one of her children speaks a little bit of English, but the other one doesn't. We have one mom with uh, two children who is completely hearing impaired. 
um, with no sound, so that's always a challenge in the shelter when children are waking up, and, and uh, we're trying to get resources for her in terms of uh, devices that'll support her. Uh, we have one woman who has uh, cognitive disabilities, one woman who just arrived a few days ago um, into the shelter who just att tried to uh, attempt suicide two weeks ago. And in January, we had five residents at the same time who all had attempted suicide, one who was actually released to us from a hospital, a psychiatric uh, ward of a hospital. So certainly the challenges that we face on a daily basis here in our shelter uh, is real. And, uh, and uh, always, uh, you know, when you have that many women coming and going in the shelter, it's always very problematic to try to give the best services you can. Um, we certainly, in the last year, we have provided service to women from all across Canada, the U.S., China, Vietnam, Germany, S uh, Syria, Lebanon, England, uh, India, and uh, some other locations with us. That's kind of the concentration of the staff that we're seeing. We're certainly servicing a, a much larger immigrant population now uh, and working with our counterparts in the community to provide the supports and the language supports that we can to ensure that they're safe and feeling that they're served in the community. Our highest uh, age range is 39 to 49, and the second highest is 50 to 59, although we do still support a very large number of, uh, of young women from 17 to 24. Um, unfortunately, that population seems to uh, growing into a culture where uh, violence is uh, becoming more normalized and certainly seeing it more in, in, in music videos and, the, and the, it just seems to be more prevalent in the community now. So uh, they're not recognizing what their experience as intimate partner violence or violence at all. Um, they just say that's normal. That's what I've grown up uh, seeing and doing. Um, certainly much what we've heard today um, in, in some of the talks. Uh, for us, a lot of the women certainly experience a lot of isolation and a sense of immediate hopelessness uh, when they're being removed from their home and they're uh, being removed from everything they know, their security, their financial security, and coming to a shelter with literally mostly t most times uh, with clothes on their back and maybe a backpack or two with their kids' belongings and diapers and toy, favorite toys. And uh, so it creates a lot of urgency and, and stress and anxiety. And, uh, and that's not even to go getting into the post-traumatic stress that the women have experienced. Um, oftentimes when they come into the shelter, they're really just trying to get through the daily life of, of managing their children and make sure they're getting their care that they need. Um, trying to limit some of the issues that we see on a, on a regular basis, or at least the top ones, I've certainly ad identified some of the things around uh, trying to operate within a harm reduction model at a shelter where we have a lot of children is uh, always complicated. Uh, we try to meet the children or the, the women where they are in their lives and uh, ensure that we can provide safe uh, and supported shelter. However, um, when you have so many children um, in our shelter a, a lot, we have to, there has to be a limit where we can ensure that they are safe as well. So, uh, so that's always a challenge for us in, uh, because a lot of our population of residents come in with addiction um, ish, addiction issues for sure. So, uh, so that's becoming a, a l very large trend for our population. The transgender community is another area that we've certainly identified as being challenging. We've certainly created policies in the last year and a half uh, to try to create more awareness for our staff and to uh, create the opportunities for us. Uh, certainly the intakes, forms that we use um, that, are, that it kind of were given to us uh, through community services years ago um, and, and the kind of the questions and stuff are really uh, intrusive and difficult to manage the most times, but we're looking at that. We certainly have lots of cooperation to and interest in revising those, but just in terms of not saying, identifying gender, let, let our clients identify uh, what, what they believe they fit under and, um, and trying to, to create a more supportive environment in the shelter for that. And also uh, mental health is, is one of our largest um, barriers to providing services. We have serious uh, issues of mental health um, that for women that come into the shelter um, and accessing medical health, uh, medical uh, specialists and services while they're in the shelter is often uh, very troublesome and, and difficult. They've left their family physician in an area, um, so getting medications, getting uh, to see a new doctor, um, sometimes they travel from another province and they've left and they haven't come with their medications and stuff. So doctors are really uh, resistant or really reluctant to provide new, men new uh, medications like clomazepam, diazepam, and all those, those kinds of prescriptions. So, it, it, you know, trying to get women stabilized enough um, so they can kind of recover, um, that, that's always, oh, I got the note. Uh, that's always uh, an interesting perspective. And um, also, certainly for women who come in who are uh, immigrant women, 
that, it, that is becoming increasingly difficult in terms of providing just sensitivity around that in terms of the services that we try to offer, but also what we're referring to in, in terms of uh, clients going out to other community services. We recently had an issue where a woman was uh, pregnant and uh, went to a clinic and was uh, had a medical assessment and an, an internal done by a male physician, and that was highly offensive to her and culturally and uh, with family, and she felt a great amount of shame, um, and uh, and that was difficult. And then she refused to go for another medical for more medical treatment. So, um, so in trying to encourage, we have to all have sensitivity around what we're doing and understanding that uh, what we do on a normal basis isn't always what's best, and to try to have some awareness around what works for people from different cultural backgrounds and different family structures, and and uh, just trying to make sure that they feel comfortable and so they do come back um, to services. And uh, I'm just trying to cover all the things, but it's not working very well. Um, and also just women who have English, uh, you know, limited English, and trying to make sure that we in a community are supporting uh, the women so they're not so isolated, because the anxiety and stress uh, certainly can be increased just by the lack of services and the isolation that they, uh, that they feel. Thank you. Since some people got the card early and some people didn't, I'd like to just give you an opportunity if you have something else you'd like to have some closing remarks. This is the unscripted portion of the program. Um, well, I guess I would say this, that uh, I kept my initial comments very brief because I expected that we'd have time for conversation and I expected that some of these issues would come up. I guess I would say this, that our response to violence needs to recognize that violence is experienced differently by different peoples. And I made it very it passing in my initial comments that certain peoples have been systematically and historically subjected to violence and that the society that is continuing to perpetrate that violence on a people can't be the society that tries to address violence in particular places within society. So I know Rocky Jones always says, for example, that in the black community in Nova Scotia, our historical relationship with the policing agencies is that we experience them as an occupying force in our communities. I'd say that the same is true in certain classes and in certain races of some of our other helping services. Child welfare, for example, health, mental health services. We are not going to be able to address the unique way in which violence experiences itself in the homes and in the communities of people that society is systemically violating until we figure that out. So um, I guess that's the powerful message that I would like to leave. So for example, um, the city of Halifax can't really begin to address violence in the community as it relates to uh, what I'll call black crime, and excuse the soundbite nature of that, when its hands are still full of the blood of Africville, right? So I think that we need to, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, uh, acknowledging the issue, right, not the speaker. But, um, so I'd say that we, we really have to think about that. We need to recognize that many, many, many of our helping services are populated by people who represent, who do not represent the class or the culture or the race of people who I'm speaking of. And we need to be conscious of that in our involvement in the movements. So I guess that would be my closing comment. Uh, if I could just um, leave you with a more hopeful thought, I would say this, that um, I consider the people in this room to be uh, champions of the cause, fighters for the right, the angels and not the demons, 
and yet there's significant diversity among us and significant disagreement among us. And I would say that um, we need to find a way to have that conversation that is collaborative and collegial and open and honest, because if we can't do it in this room, heaven help us. A couple of things that I forgot to mention, um, that the television ads, if you've seen those uh, lately on television about uh, elder abuse, that's a collaborative effort, federal, provincial, and territorial effort, and the number that's shown on, on television, when people from Nova Scotia call in, they get numbers and uh, offices to contact in Nova Scotia, and that's the same with each uh, jurisdiction. Um, the other, uh, an interesting project we're involved in, a pilot project, is uh, looking at senior abuse from a restorative justice perspective, and so really looking at healing, how, how to heal uh, what's been happening in that situation. And, but having said that, uh, I think that works in, in some situations, perhaps in a lot of situations, but uh, also the uh, Power of Attorney Act is uh, being revised, and I think that in some situations there really need to be some stronger consequences for the types of abuse that we see seniors uh, experiencing. Uh, and a lot of it right now is entitlement of adult children, that uh, they see their aging parents with resources, with money, and they're not, many of them are not prepared to wait until that may be left to them. And so that's where we're seeing uh, increased amounts of financial abuse. I think that's it, thank you. I think I just want to highlight uh, and thank all the panelists today, but just highlight, I think the, there's so, still so much stigma attached to abuse and intimate partner violence and men's violence against women that um, women still find it very difficult uh, to talk about uh, intimate partner violence or to identify with healthcare workers, with doctors, with emergency physicians, uh, that that is exactly what their experience is because there's still a lot of judgment, there's still a lot of shame, and again, it's a lot of self-blaming that I should have known better. I should have not gotten myself into this. And, and so I think as healthcare providers, we have to understand that that is still the language that is still being put out there. It's still the idea that people hold about themselves. I have an education, a degree. I should have known better. Um, you know, I, I've seen my mother do this. I should have known better. So just to be aware that um, there's lots of shame and humiliation, and even the women that come to the shelter uh, although we know they have they have the scars or they have the stories, they, it still very much minimizes it because there's lots of, of that still attached to those experiences. And we have to give women room or uh, any victim of violence room to allow themselves to process that and allow themselves to come to that place where uh, they feel that they can talk about it without um, being labeled in, in, within their peer group. And uh, so I guess for us, recognizing the signs is important, uh, but supporting, again, people where they are uh, is always the most important and uh, valuable place to be. For me, um, just stepping out of the work that I do um, as a social worker in the Emerge Department at the Kiwi 2 um, and the work that I do um, as a consultant with the Department of Health and Wellness uh, Continuing Care Branch, being involved with the diversity committee has been such a wonderful experience. Um, when we first initially started out in, in helping to develop and, and uh, mature this particular form, our lens was, was a, um, uh, a little narrow, if you will. Um, and for me, you know, again, being a gay man and living the experiences of a gay man every day, um, there was a great opportunity uh, for us as a diversity committee in planning this particular form to broaden that lens based on what the face of domestic violence looks like. Because as it, a lot of our panelists up here uh, had mentioned, and it's probably been referenced throughout the day, um, the faces of, of domestic violence is women, it's children, it's, it's men, men being abused by their female partners, uh, LGBTI or LGBT persons, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to commend the diversity committee in taking such wonderful steps in bringing such a wonderful group of folks together to look at a broader lens as it relates to domestic violence because I really think we've come to a point in our society, especially in the province of Nova Scotia, as our landscape is changing. And when I say landscape in regards to uh, the folks who are disclosing 
uh, domestic violence as it relates to them. Um, having an opportunity to come here and speak to that and speak a little bit outside the box and uh, the information that will be used today that will feed into guidelines as it relates to the Domestic Violence Action Plan, I think is fantastic. And I just want to applaud the folks on the Diversity Committee and all of you for being part of this today. So I'd like to thank the panel. We have James, Shireen, Robert, Valerie, and Lori. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.